go ahead and launch the satellite uh, software program. And it takes a while to come up and initialize. And a couple of things that I've found out about the program, they're different than you find in typically with other programs. If you save a file in this program, which we will end up doing, that's actually what I'm going to ask you guys to turn in is the set file that you actually create in this program. And then also the exported lighting diagram from it as well. It's two different files. Um, you find that if you simply double click on one of those set programs, it does not launch. It launches the program, but then you get an error message saying it can't open it. So this thing should open up and you should have on one side, so a screen should open up that says Satellite 3 Day Studio and it's a dialog box. And on one side, it'll have recent files. In your case, you may not have any recent files. Uh, that'll be on the left-hand side. And then the right-hand side, it should have new shooting and it should have large room, medium room, and small room. Can you guys just give me a thumbs up or a shake a head and say, yep, that's what you're seeing? Okay, good. So I'm gonna quit asking you guys if you're seeing this stuff, but if you something goes wrong and you don't and, and, and you're not with whatever, again, turn on your mic, speak up and just say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, I, cause I wanna get everybody, uh, I, I don't want anybody left behind. I don't want anybody, uh, this happens in my retouching class, is, is that if people will just stop me for one second and we can recover from, from whatever, happened um then then they can continue to work on the entire exercise for the entire you know period of class and but i've seen other people actually get not and they also they'll just stop and decide they're just going to watch and then they sit there and they do nothing for three hours except you know watch this screen and that's just a horrible way to learn so at any rate um i'm going to ask everybody to start we're going to click on the medium room that's where i want to sort of start so if you click on the medium room it should open up to a screen and when mine opens up it actually opens up and what i see on my screen is in the very center of my screen hang on just one second guys i gotta check something else on my screen really quick sorry Uh, okay, so when mine opens up, what I see on my screen is in the very center of it, there is uh, supposed to be a room that's actually got a model standing on a suite with a camera that is in bright red, uh, and then two lights. There's a, uh, looks like a background hair light and then a front light. Is that sort of what you guys are looking at? Yep, okay. So to give you some idea of sort of what's going on, we're gonna start on the top left-hand side. We're gonna get rid of all of this in just a second, but I just wanna sort of walk you through this part. The first place that I actually wanna to go to is up to, if you take a look on the very top left-hand side, you'll see you've got a file menu, you've got an edit menu, you've got a settings menu, and you've got a help menu. That's on the top left-hand side. There's a couple of other things that run across the top of your screen, but those are the ones that I wanna pay attention to just right now. So if you click on the file menu to actually get that drop down, you will actually see that your options are new project, open project, save project for me is grayed out because right now I haven't changed anything on this and then save project as. So these are pretty much the typical stuff that you guys would use with any file. It's the same way you would do what these are considered projects in here, but in Word, it would be a new document and it would be save document or this. So that part is pretty much all the same. Uh, the import user data and the export user data is something esoteric. I have yet to be able to find out what that actually is. It doesn't really have anything to do with our setups right now, so I'm not going to worry about that. But when I do get an answer to it, I will. Uh, also, there's a quit menu at the very bottom of that. That'll actually quit the program. Now, you would think that if you come off of that file menu, you would think that, again, I've got the three little stoplights that are sitting up at the very top. Uh, of top left of my screen. You would think that if you simply clicked on the red one that all it would do would be to close this one setup and that we would still be in the program, you would be wrong. If you click on that little red thing, it actually quits the program. So just so you guys know, <clears throat> that's what's, what's going on here. Another thing that I have found uh, on this, um, actually, if you guys can switch back to me really quickly, I just wanna show you this real fast. 
If you take a look at your system preferences in this, the system preferences that um, um, Satellite expects to see are the defaults. So if for some reason, I'm gonna click on my display thing right here. In my displays for my big monitor, I actually like to scale it up. I like to go to a bigger monitor for me to see this in because it's a bigger monitor sitting pretty far away. When you do that, you will lose things in satellite. There are things that you should be able to see that you can't see. So you pretty much have to work at the default setup. That's what satellite's expecting to see. So if all of a sudden you figure or you see that you're actually not being able to see things that you should be able to see, make sure that those settings are set at their default. So again, system preferences for your displays. So then back into satellite, we've gone through the file menu to begin with. If we go to the edit menu next, in the edit menu, we're gonna use a couple of things here. There's not a lot in here that matters to us except for this load reference image. If you take a look, clear set is something we're gonna use. And what clear set will do is it will get rid of everything on our set except for the camera to leave the camera. And it will also leave the, um, uh, the walls and the ceiling. That part will actually stay in there. Um, you don't need to worry about adding flash heads, uh, speed lights, managing that kind of stuff, whatever. All of that happens in other places as well. So we don't really need it there. It's somewhat redundant. Load reference image does matter because load reference image is how you can actually take the tear sheets that you have that you want to try to recreate the lighting on and actually load them and bring them into the software program and they will float all over your software program so that you can reference back and forth to them. You can say, oh yeah, that lighting looks right or oh yeah, that color of gel looks right and that kind of stuff. So anyway, that's what's going on right there. We'll talk about rendering selected snapshots and that kind of stuff in a little bit. Um, the next one over is settings. This one's critical for us, so it's a place that I definitely need you to go now. So in settings, you probably, if it hasn't already, you want English to be your language. Um, also in the middle uh, section right there, for me, I've actually changed my measurement systems from metric to imperial. It just means that all of the readouts that I'm going to get will be in feet and inches as opposed to meters. If you are the kind of person who, who, who is used to working in meters and centimeters and, that, and you prefer to keep it that way, go right ahead. Don't, I, that's not a problem here. Under, so you want to check mark, for me anyway, I've got a check next to Imperial. The next one down, uh, grid in yard. What that will do is it will actually lay a grid out on your floor and it's just a reference. So it's a good thing to have. It's something that I keep on. Um, when I'm in studios, typically, um, uh, uh, not the studio that we're in right now, but the old space that we were in, they actually had uh, tiles on the floor and you could use tile marks on the floor or if they're wooden floors, you can use the strips of wood on a floor to actually know that things are this equal distance from a background or that kind of stuff. But you can use it to help line things up. Um, so for me, I actually like to have that. If it bothers you, uncheck that. You can take it off. It doesn't matter. It's not gonna really impact a whole lot. Uh, the next thing down under settings is uh, um, laser pointer. You definitely want that turned on. What that does is it actually will give you a laser pointer coming out of all of your lights to show you where, where, what they're actually pointing at, what they're actually looking at. When you go to reset a light, when you tilt ahead or pan ahead or do that kind of stuff, whatever, um, the laser pointer will actually go across your set and it'll either hit the model or the seamless or the wall or another light or something like that. It'll, whatever, it's, it just gives you a, a, a reference for what it's pointing at. So I definitely wanna keep that part on. Lens flare is something else that you wanna keep on in here. now. Lens flare, it actually does a pretty good rendering job of this, a shockingly good job of this. You don't pick up lens flares in any of the soft modifiers. So if you're working with soft boxes, you won't see lens flare even though if it would be there. But in the harder light sources, you will actually pick it up. And that's something that I definitely think you should have on. Um, and then the next thing down, again, uh, is gonna be quality options. Now, when I select quality options, what ends up happening in my screen is, I don't get to see my entire, I don't get to see all of them. I see three, uh, four things that possibilities that come up for me. Um, but what these are, are <clears throat> these impact how fast this program works for you. So what they are is they're in large measure rendering settings. And if you take a look at yours, you can go ahead and open yours up. Again, I'm not sure that you'll see all of it, but hopefully you'll see some of it. At the very top, you should have a thing that says shadow quality. 
and you will see that to the right of that is there's two triangles there's a white triangle that's marked speed and there's another uh, yellow triangle that's marked as quality and then there's a slider and a scale going from one to five across that what those things are telling you is is that in terms of how your shadows are rendered you can either have better quality shadows at the expense of speed or you can have much faster rendering of your shadows at the expense of the quality it's a trade-off and there's no other ways of getting around it it just is what it is the same thing happens for texture quality it's the thing that falls right underneath it as does render quality which is the thing that falls underneath that and then finally render resolution we will talk about what rendering is to death in here in just a second uh, and then um, but I'm going to suggest at least in the beginning you leave these at the defaults and so the default would be three for the shadow quality two for the texture quality two for the render quality and then for the render resolution again what that is is that once you feel like you've got lighting the way you want it you actually can render the file out to a high-res version of that file <clears throat> and this is just telling you how big it's going to be so the 1200 pixels is the one again it's the default if you've got a really, really, really powerful machine and you want to uh, um, uh, um, uh, 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 crank those up so that you have better quality on all of those, uh, if your machine can handle it, that's great. But if all of a sudden you're trying to actually render something out and see how it looks, and it takes you know 15 minutes for you to render a file for you to say, oh God, I hate that, I didn't want that to begin with, whatever, you're just gonna get frustrated. So <clears throat> my suggestion is leave them at their defaults until you know, um, uh, uh, something else until something different so again for me right now I can't get out of this I can't get out of this screen so I actually may have to start my program again oh, no I can escape out of it so that's what I ended up doing so I'm good there um, okay so finally on the last of the <clears throat> uh, the menus to go over if you click on the help on the drop down for help, you will see that there is an FAQ. There's also a user manual. The user manual, you know, I should tell you this. This is a, um, the program itself is um, uh, incredibly deep, but it doesn't have a huge learning curve. Again, I've been working with this now for three days. Um, and, and again, what you can do with it is pretty remarkable, but um, the way they've actually implemented the majority of it, uh, that modeled with, or that combined with what you guys already know, um, it's not like you're, it's, this is not like learning Photoshop. This is not like learning Capture One. This is not, it is nowhere near that intense. Um, however, so the manual itself is uh, uh, 80, 90 pages long, but the majority of it is just giant pictures and they'll have some little, you know, text written under it. So you can blow through the manual in a, in a morning. So I, I'm just saying uh, all of these things you might want to sort of familiarize yourself with. Um, Michaela actually has worked with this program before. She actually knows part of it. And so I was excited. She would written when she saw this. Um, she was like, oh, my God, I've worked with this before. I really like the program. I think you do. Right, Michaela? Yep. Um, so at any rate, that's that. So to begin with, in our setup that we've got going right here right now, again, um, the three other things that are four of the things that we should talk about really quick. Um, as you continue along that very top menu bar, you'll see that there's a thing that says setup. Then there is another thing that says view. If you click on view, you won't see anything because we haven't done any snapshots yet. Then there is an export. And then in my case, I have community. Do you guys have community? You do. Uh, I'm not sure. I think community has been locked out for you guys. Um, it's uh, because of the college. That's all I'm going to say. The two things that options that exist for the program that you guys don't have is nudity and community. Those are the two things that they shut off for everybody. So at any rate, um, so I'm going to stick with setup here to begin with. Just underneath setup, you will see that there's a couple of other things. There is a uh, um, um, uh, yellow arrow that is selection mode. Right next to that is a ruler, which is measurement mode. Next to that is the grid. If yours is yellow right now and you enabled it in the settings, you should see a grid on your floor. 
If you click that, the grid goes away. It's just a visualization on and off your floor. Uh, and then the next thing over there is to show and hide measurements. We're gonna get to that part later, so don't worry about that right now. In our case, it's on, my case, it's on. The next thing that's over is studio light. Everybody see that thing? Studio light is important here because of the metaphor about the way this program works. So, in the setup that we've got going on right now, what is happening is, is in the very large picture that you see in the middle, this is supposed to be, it's what it's supposed to be recreating for you, is what it would be like standing in the studio. So if we were really in the studio right now, you would have the modeling lights would actually be showing some things. Um, if you had lights on in the studio, they would be showing, you know, you would be able to see things in the studio. However, that's not the image that you see when you actually make a picture. When you make a picture, the camera opens up, the flashes fire, then if we're shooting tethered, that image comes into capture one. That's what you're seeing in the little picture that is to the far right side. The little picture to the far right side is the way the camera would actually see this right now, not the way it looks in the studio. So does that make sense to you guys? There is a studio view and then there is an in-camera view. And one of the mistakes that people, it seems to me, could make in this is that they actually are trying to look at the lighting that exists in the studio view, not in the camera view. And that is misleading. So the shadows that you see in the big preview are not what you're going to get when you actually create a picture. We good on that part? All right. Um, you can switch these two. If you go over and you take a look at the little small camera view, that's the one on the far right hand side, you'll see in its lower left hand corner, there's a set of arrows that are pointing left and right that are nestled next to each other. If you click on that, these two views flip. And the view that we now have that's in the big screen right now is what my camera is showing me. You'll see there's a whole series of camera settings that sit right up above it. And then that smaller, more studio view is in the smaller right-hand window now. Those things are constantly interchangeable. I'm gonna click on mine to change it back so that it looks like the way it did when I very first opened this screen up. So again, I've got uh, the bigger view where I can see the lights and all that kind of stuff is in my middle screen part. Uh, as we continue across the top, I'm gonna start with the camera part first. So if you go all the way over to the right-hand side, up the very top, you'll actually see you can have a drop-down menu. So the first thing that you, there's a number of, of options that we can change in here. Hang on one second, guys. I'm gonna, I feel like I'm looking at, I feel like my image of myself is some horror movie. So I'm gonna bring up a little more ambient light in here. Oh, so much better. Okay. Um, oh, I wanna go back to the studio light thing first. So forget the camera part where we just were, just back again to the, right above the, um, uh, the set frame, there's that thing that says studio light. If you click on that and you drag to the right, you'll see it actually lightens up the ambient light in the studio. If you drag in the, all the way down to the left, it knocks all of those lights down. That's all that that is supposed to be about. In my experience, leaving it in the middle has actually worked out pretty well. So back over now to the far right hand side, the camera. So you'll see the first thing, if you drop down, it says full frame. If you click on that little arrow, it'll drop down. You can actually change the, this is the format of your camera. So you can actually change what it is. So I think all of you guys are working full frame. I don't think anybody is working with a, a, um, a smaller APS camera or anything like that. So you can simply leave this at full frame and it will emulate your 35 millimeter. Again, there is a roll of film, uh, it's, they call it roll of film right here. I think it's a takeoff on roll of flex. It's a six by six that would be closer hey, to four. Yeah. Can you share your screen with us again? Oh, sorry, I thought I was. Yes, I can. You good? Yep, okay. Sorry about that. 
Uh, okay, so um, full frame in that drop down part. For the most part, you guys would keep that in full frame. If we start to work our way over to the right, you'll see the next thing is a ratio. And if you click on that little drop down menu, you'll see that you can do a three by two, a four by five, a four by three, a blah, 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 blah. This allows you to change it depending on the camera that you're trying to emulate. So for all 35 millimeters that are full frame, that would be a three by two. If you were shooting a view camera, that would be a four by five. If you were shooting, uh, I'm gonna skip over the four by three. If you were shooting uh, any of the Hasselblad series, the medium format, current style medium format cameras, not the old school uh, Hasselblad, all of those are six, four, five. So um, that's what the Mamiya's at, uh, the, at school are, would be six, four, five, would be that cropping. One to one would be a square. Um, and then again, they've got some weird other ratios that are in here. Um, none of those would actually really matter to us. The only ones that are going to matter to us really are going to be the three by two, um, the six, four, five, and then again, a one to one if you were trying to emulate square format. So in our case, I'm going to ask you at least for the time being to leave this at um, uh, um, uh, 3.2 or, or three to two ratio. The next thing that comes over is white balance in Kelvin, and this would actually be trying to make this the equivalent of shooting transparency film. So in shooting transparency film, hang on just one second. Anyway, um, in shooting transparency film, you actually have to pick the color of the lights that you're actually going to shoot with. So uh, the typical two films that you get in transparency film are daylight balanced and tungsten balanced. In the case of working with all strobes in here, we would want this to be daylight balanced, which is what it is at 6,000 degrees Kelvin. If you click on this drop down menu again, next to that, you can actually have a Kelvin slider and you can change that. You can shoot hot lights on this screen. So there is this thing down here, uh, we'll get to that in a second. You can shoot hot lights in this software program. And if you were to do that, depending on the hot light you were using, there are some hot lights like Kinaflow and uh, HMI that are daylight balanced. You would leave that Kelvin setting at 6,000 6, degrees Kelvin. If you were moving though to tungsten lighting like the Mole Richardson's that we have at the studio or the Smith Victor's, that kind of stuff, whatever, you would actually change that to 32 degrees Kelvin because that's the color of lights. You want your capture, color to match your uh, source color. So that's what's going on there. Since we're gonna only be working with strobes, we'll actually be fine if, as far as that part goes. So then coming down to the next part under on the left-hand side, if you click on that drop-down menu, you get your focal length lens. So for the time being right now, even though you know I hate that 24 to 105 millimeter lens, um, for uh, just being able to work here and give us a little bit more range, whatever, I'm gonna leave this as a 24-105. But you need to realize that uh, some of the fixed primes that they've actually got in here will have an impact on how your lighting renders, specifically things like bokeh and soft focus. Um, you can set focus in this program. So depth of field comes to play in here. So the lens that you're using will have an impact on this. Uh, the focal length, certainly in terms of compression and that kind of stuff will have another impact on this. So this thing matters. Um, but again, for our purposes, learning tonight, setting this up, we are going to be shooting full frame or full length tonight. So um, this is going to be a good place for us to be. Um, the next thing over is shutter speed of your camera. Again, we're going to leave this at 125th. It works pretty much the very same way. Uh, I haven't tried actually to see if this will cause uh, I, I don't know that the software in here actually will emulate uh, sync speed, so I don't know if I set up my strobes to shoot and set uh, a shutter speed of uh, 500th of a second if I'll get the dreaded black bar, um, but we'll see. Anyway, for the bros part, I'm going to leave this at 125th of a second. However, if we were mixing ambient light into this, which would be a possibility, then shutter speed will have an impact on this. So if we were mixing uh, hot lights with uh, flash, then that would actually um, uh, definitely uh, have an impact on what our shutter speed was. But for the most part right now, I'm going to leave it at 125th of a second. I'm lucky I have a model who doesn't move a lot. Um, the next thing over is aperture. And again, this will actually control your depth of field here. So all of that's going to matter. And then finally, we have ISO uh, uh, the last part over. If you then look on the uh, right-hand side, far right-hand side of that window, you'll see that there is a slider <clears throat> that if you click on it, 
it will actually give you a scale. It is your, um, uh, it's a slider that goes up and down. There's a little circle on a bar that goes up on, on the far right hand side. If you click and you drag all the way up the top, this is your zoom. If you go all the way up to the very top, you'll see that it actually uh, tops out at a 105. If you go all the way back down to the bottom, you'll see that it bottoms out at a 24 because we have this lens set at 24 to 105. So this whole thing in here is my camera setup. So I'm gonna go back into the middle where it was. In the middle, the sort of the default middle of this lens, I think is about 63 millimeters, 64 millimeters, somewhere in there. You'll notice on the model right now that there is a set of, of, of uh, dots, uh, squares that are uh, laid out right on top of her, or at least in my screen they are. Um, those are focus points and you can click on one to actually change your focus point and it will change. So um, those things, when we move around, you'll see we'll be able to focus on different things. Um, I'm, for the time being, I'm gonna click on the one and leave it as the uh, focus point that's right in the middle. If you don't like to see that focus overlay, if you look right underneath that zoom slider, you'll see that there is a, um, a little square that's got a set of boxes in it. If you uncheck that, or if you click on that, you'll see that it, uh, the, the uh, focus points on your screen actually go away. Um, focus in this is automatic unless you specifically change the focus points, which you can do. Um, the next thing that's underneath that, under the focus point on and off, is a histogram. If you click on that, it will show you the histogram. Uh, you guys know this about me already. Working in a studio and looking at histograms to me is pointless, so I am going to leave that part off. Um, the next thing that's underneath that is your screen orientation. So it's simply whether, in my case right now, mine's set up to shoot vertical. But if you click on it, it will actually change it to horizontal and click on it again, it'll switch it back to vertical. And then finally, the last thing that's underneath it is how you actually rotate the view that is in the camera. So if you click on this very bottom thing, the bottom point right here and come over, actually click on that icon itself and move it. So you need to click on the icon and, and move it while you're still holding it down you'll see that you'll be able to pan your camera down, you'll be able to pan up, you'll be able to pan to the left, you'll be able to pan to the right. That's basically what's uh, actually going on there. So um, there are other places that you can control that in your camera, but that's what's actually going on in here. So uh, we're almost done here really quickly. I wanna show you two other things fast. If you come right down underneath the view of your camera, and click on top view, you will actually see a, a ceiling down view of what is on your set. So you should see in the upper left hand side of it, you should see the back hair light. In the middle of the screen, you will actually see the seamless. You should see the top of the model's head. You should also be able to see the uh, 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 main beauty dish light that's on the further to the right, and then the camera, which is red. If you come and you click on the camera itself, so if you hover over the camera here in the top view, you will see that you get um, a, a four square of arrows. There's an arrow that's going forward, left, right, and, uh, and then towards the bottom of the screen. If you click on that, you can actually move your camera around and you will see it change its position in the main screen as well as in the top view down. But you'll also notice that Hang on, I just lost my mouse again. You'll also notice that it changes your angle of view. What you should also notice though is that there is a laser line that's actually shooting out of the front of that camera. There's a red line in that top view down. If you look in your big screen as well, you'll also notice that there's a red line coming out of that as well right now. So that right now, no matter where I move this camera, it's actually locked onto the model. We can unlock that, we can lock it, we can keep it on. It's something though that, uh, especially when you start working in this 3D world that actually, it just makes things uh, a little bit simpler. Again, you can unlock that so that you can move around. Uh, um, uh, but right now, if we were trying to set things up and move in and that kind of stuff, whatever, it, uh, it helps do the reframing in your camera. So it just makes the program a little bit faster to actually work with. Um, if you click on one of the lights, you'll also notice that you can move it as well. And you'll also notice that there's a line that shoots out of it as well. 
right now, all of these things are actually locked onto the model. That doesn't mean they need to stay that way, but that's the way it's actually set up in the beginning. Um, finally, if you actually look on the, for again, in this still top view that we're dealing with right now, on the far left-hand side, I'm sorry, right-hand side down at the very bottom, there's another four square of arrows right there. If you actually click on those, on that part right here, actually you got to have, I cannot get that to do anything. So never mind. I don't really control what I see of my set here. If you click on the magnifying glass, and that's, that's one that will change here. So click on the magnifying glass. And again, click your mouse on the magnifying glass on the far right lower side and push your uh, uh, mouse cursor towards the top of your screen, you'll see that you actually zoom in. Now when you click on that four square arrow, you can actually move around. The reason the four square wasn't moving anything was because we were seeing the entire screen. Uh, and then finally, if you click on the, um, it, it, the last icon that's underneath the magnifying glass, that is the four corners with the plus in the middle, it returns you to the default view where you can see everything in your uh, top view down. And then finally, if you go over to set list, it's the thing that is now right across to the right of top view. If you click on that, you'll actually see there's three tabs that sit up at the very top. If you click on the one that says all, you have a list of everything that is in your set right now. If you look at the very top, you've got a camera. If you look onto the, so again, it's sort of like layers in Photoshop. If you click on the camera to actually make it active, you will notice that on your major screen, whatever, you get all of this yellow shit that's happening all over this. Those are all controls for how you can raise, lower, reposition, repan, and retilt your camera. All of those things we'll get to in just a little bit. However, if you look again over in the set list itself, there is an eyeball that's right next to camera. If you click on that eyeball, your camera is simply hidden. It's not that you got rid of it, it's just hidden. Uh, and this can help you out when you're trying to actually lay out lights and do certain things, whatever here. Sometimes stuff is in the way and it's just a way to temporarily hide things. So if you, so may I have a question? Uh, if you click the eyeball back on, the camera comes back on. If you go to the other side of the camera, that same sort of layer metaphor that we're talking about, you'll see that there's a padlock on the other side. If you click on the padlock, that means that the camera now is locked down. The camera, you cannot move the camera. So again, if you get things into place and you don't want somehow for things to move, then you can actually lock them down. So I'm going to unlock my camera, though, because I do want to be able to change it. If you then come to the one underneath it, the layer that's underneath it is your background layer, and this allows you to do uh, control your background. If you go to the next thing under, you'll see that it's a light source that's in here, and it turns out that it's actually the rear light source. We'll talk about all doing lighting and that kind of stuff later on. If we come down to the next uh, thing that's under here is the beauty dish, and that actually shows up. And then finally, if you come down to the very bottom, they have a layer called Victoria, and that's actually the model. So again, if you turn the eyeball on and off, you can actually get rid of Victoria. If you then go to, again, looking at the tabs that are running across the top of those layers, you can go to equipment only. If you click on that, that only shows you the lighting gear. So you'll notice the model is no longer there, the background seamless is no longer there, the camera is no longer there, the only thing here are the lights. So it just is a way to get to things simpler and faster instead of having to go through the, uh, the entire set list. And then if finally, if you click on objects, which is all the way to the right-hand side, um, you get nothing because there are no objects out on this set right now. So I am going to temporarily stop my screen share and I'm gonna come back to you guys. And I'm going to ask, are there any questions so far about the whole sort of interface? Are we good on this so far? Mm -hmm. Anybody? You guys all go away. So when, when I screen share, I lose you. So uh, I, I'm just wanting to make sure everybody's hanging in here and doing good. Are we all right? Good. Okay. I'm going to go back to screen share. We're going to take a look a, a little bit more of the rest of the part around here. And then we're actually going to do something with this thing. So. Um, 
you'll at least be happy to know that part of your home, well, the entire thing that's assignment that's due for today is actually gonna be what we do here. So at the end of it all, if you stay with me and do it all, you'll simply have to be able to just simply turn it in. And okay. Um, all right, so I'm gonna screen share again. Okay, so um, we've gotten through the sort of the top part of our uh, setup here. We've gotten through the right hand side. I'm going to go all the way over to the opposite side over here. I'm going to start at the top left hand side right now. And what I want you to do is actually, before we get there, simply click on the model. So in the big screen that is in the very middle, simply click on the model itself. Victoria and you should see on the right hand side essentially all the properties for Victoria you should see the word that says Victoria at the top right under the file menu there's a small little uh, snapshot of her face right there and then underneath all of this you will have uh, so there's a small snapshot there's a thing that says pose slider posing mode a couple of icons underneath that we will look at those in just a second and then underneath that part, you'll have things that are that says style is where we'll start with. So does everybody have style? Are we seeing that? Okay, so with style, you can see you can change things about this person. So for instance, you can click on a different hairstyle and she will get that different hairstyle. So it's a certain amount of flexibility that exists in that. If you then start to scroll down in the style section right here, you will actually come to the clothing section. And in the clothing section, I'm gonna pick the one sort of in the second row, second from the left. If you click on that, it actually puts her in this sort of like green, I don't know, uh, 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 I don't even know what the hell you would call that. It's not really a jumpsuit, but it wants to be. Um, at any rate, you, so you can change the actually style of clothing in here. Um, as you continue down underneath that part, it is a jumpsuit, that's what they're calling it right here. You'll see next to the word at the very bottom down here that says jumpsuit, you'll actually see a small color swatch that sits right to the right of all of this. If you actually click on that, you'll get a file menu that gives you a color picker and you can actually change this jumpsuit to any color that you want and it's a conventional color picker. So you can sort of like go through, you can actually also grab, uh, it's the very same one that comes out of Photoshop. You can grab the little circle that's sitting in the color field so that you can actually push it up to the top, which will make your image lighter. You can push it, your color lighter, drag it to the bottom, which makes your color darker. You can move your, the little dot towards the right-hand side of your screen, which makes it more saturated, or to the left-hand side of the screen, which desaturates it. So you have the complete infinite range of all color that you could actually get into Photoshop you can make uh, this outfit any of those colors. Um, so that that part is just there. Hardness, and this hardness slider exists in a lot of places, and what hardness is actually supposed to be is the sheen. It's supposed to be a sense of gloss on this thing. So if you grab this hardness slider and drag it all the way up, uh, you'll sort of pick out here, you see that her, uh, uh, her uh, again, you're not, do not look at the large screen set. What you want to look at is the camera version of this. Again, the changes that we make here are more truly reflected in the camera view than they are in the studio view. So even though you can do a lot of work in the studio view, you should be going back to that camera view every now and then. I just, swipped, I just switched mine again so that my camera view was the bigger view. And you can see it's supposed to be really sparkly now. That's what hardness is actually all about. Hardness shows up as well. It's not just in clothes, it shows up in skin as well. And it really is a function of gloss for lack of a better way of putting it. As we continue, I'm gonna actually switch back now so that, cause I, I went, I made the camera view my big view. Um, I'm gonna continue to go down now. You can actually see, you can change shoe style and you can change shoe color. As you continue to go down, you can actually put glasses on the model. You can put sunglasses on the model or no glasses on the model. As you continue to go down, you can actually change her eye color. And then finally, as you get down toward, sort of towards the bottom, you can actually change skin color. So you can go from classically Caucasian to classically African-American to classically mannequin. Do you guys have a mannequin option? Yeah. 
Okay. I just, uh, again, I'm not sure. I just wasn't sure if they knocked that one out. Uh, for me right now, I mean, it doesn't really matter which of these you actually want to pick. You can go for it. You'll notice, though, that you can actually change skin. Okay, so skin hardness, again, is gloss. That sheen on her face. If you take skin tone and you actually drag it, you'll see, again, you need to reference your camera readout, not your, you'll see a little bit of it in the studio view, but you get a real better sense of what's going on in the uh, 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 camera view. And it's really funny, if you guys can, I don't know if you can get to my screen really quickly, but I've actually managed to make my model look just like Donald Trump. Really bad blonde comb over and orange skin. I digress. You know, I do miss you guys. I really wish I was in class with you right now, but anyway. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna go back to the original skin tone. And then finally, the last part down here is you can change makeup. You'll also see that there's an extra slider for lip glossiness. There's also a change for nail color on this. And then finally, at the very bottom, you have two options. You have remove from set and duplicate. This actually works for pretty much everything on your set. I don't think you can duplicate a camera, but you can duplicate lights, you can duplicate chairs, you can duplicate all those sorts of things, or you can simply click on remove from set. So in my case, I just clicked remove from set. And then finally, I am, so that sort of gets us through that part. If you then take a look on the very bottom, you should see, again, it's our last menu, and as soon as we get through this, guys, we're pretty much done with the whole interface. The first option that you've got on the left-hand side is timeline. If you click on timeline, you'll actually see a screen opens up, and we don't have anything that's in our timeline. This is where images are stored that we work on. There's two kinds of images, and you need to know the difference in these. One is called a snapshot, and the other is actually called a rendered image. And this is very much like the metaphor when we shoot tethered. When we're actually shooting tethered and it's going into Capture One, you are getting raw files in that in Capture One. A raw file is one third the size of a rendered file, but it doesn't have all the detail in it. So for instance, you can have more ray in, a, uh, in the preview of a raw file in Capture One, that does not show up in your rendered file or your processed file. The same thing can happen actually here in this one. The thing about snapshots, and you'll see if you look to the right-hand side of that timeline, there's snap at the top and then there's render at the bottom. The difference in those two is snapshots are very low res captures of what your camera is seeing. So it's much better information than you're getting in the studio. It's basically a record of what you were seeing in your camera at that point. These things become important to us because we can actually go back and forth in time depending on that. So let's say you wanted to try out six different angles of your camera. You could actually do six different snapshots. It goes pretty quick. You can compare them pretty quick. But the only one that you would ultimately want to render out would actually be the final one that you pick because it, again, it ends up being a much bigger file. It will take a lot more time, blah, 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 blah. So that's the difference in snapshots and rendering. Again, we'll get into that as we start working our way down the line. The next of the tabs that is over on that bottom part is models. In the models that you see right here, in my case, if you take a look, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there's eight different models. Um, so there's the Victoria one, the one we've been working with initially, that's the one that comes on by default. There's Jessica, who's a little bit smaller, sort of gender neutral person. Then there's Amy, who's a little bit younger. There's Kira. There's Sarah, who's the only real kid, I think, in here, or, or supposed to be kid. Um, there's Thomas, the old guy. And then there's Mike, the middle. I don't, who, I don't know who the hell Mike's supposed to be. And then there's Jamal. So all of these are customizable, though. So you could, again, you can make, you know, you can make Jessica African-American. You can make uh, Kira uh, uh, Caucasian. So, all of that is completely open to us. So it's all these are actually possibilities. Um, they're starting points. If you go to the next of the tabs over, monolites. And monolites are where we do most of the work that is going to emulate what happens in the studio. Now, in this case, they call it monolites, but you shouldn't confuse that with the strobes that we typically use in the studio. Monolites would be very close to, well, they are exactly the pro photos, the D2s that we use in the studio, those are monolites. It's basically the power source and the lamp head are together in one single package. 
um, the things like uh, um, the speedatrons are not monolites because the speedatron is a power pack that you can add up to six heads to. So again, not a monolite situation at all. However, these will function the same way for us. So basically what we're doing is we're eliminating the power pack here. We're just putting it all into one. But all of the controls that you would have using a speedatron exist here. Watt seconds exist here. All of that kind of stuff exists here. So it's just they put it together in one package and it's fine because you can emulate anything in this. If you take a look across, you have different types of, um, of monolites in here. There is a gobo projector here in the very beginning. That's pretty much like the focusing spot strobe that we use in the studio. There is a ring light. There actually is a ring light in the photo studio. There's a couple of them in the photo studio. We'll talk about what they are and how they work. The next one over is a reflector and you'll see they put it into two different sort of settings right here. The first says there's a little circle with it. Um, uh, there's a little circle with a slash through it. That's an indication that there is no grid in this reflector. The thing that's right next to it, which in my case says seven inches because I set my screen to measure in Imperial, is exactly the reflector that we use in the Speedatron. It is a seven inch reflector. And then there's a degree marker here. We don't actually work in degrees in the stuff that we work with in the studio, but there are systems like Braun Color that actually uh, talk about their modifiers in terms of degrees. If you want to actually know what we emulate in the studio, what we would actually be emulating in the Speedatron setup, the smallest of those reflectors is a seven inch reflector, which is this one right here. The next size up is an 11 inch reflector and the closest one would be this 12 inch reflector right here. Then uh, they have much other, they've got a much better set than the Speedatron line actually has. You'll notice that there's a 14 inch reflector here that's a little bit deeper. If you grab the scroll bar along the bottom and start to drag your way over, you'll actually see other things that they do. They call this an accent tube, that's really just a snoot. Then they have a beauty dish right here. Then they have an octaform that's a two inch, uh, I mean a two foot one. Then they've got like a two and a half foot one, a three foot one, uh, almost up to a 40 inch one. 40 inch would be a four, eight, uh, uh, would be a four foot one. Then this 59 inch uh, octaform right here would be getting close to an Allen Chrome. That's an octabank. That would be what that was basically is. Now, they, you can modify these modifiers quite a bit. You don't have to just stick with the modifier itself. These are just the bases, but just like the models where you could change all of those attributes, you can do the same thing with these modifiers as well. Um, the next set that goes over, these are more, these parabolic, these are more like the breezy line of stuff. We don't have any of this stuff at the photo studio. Um, we can talk about, if we have time later on, what these really are and how they uh, pretty much work. Um, and again, I don't know, I can look at it here though really quickly to see. It does not look like, oh, let me just see really fast. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't here. So uh, again, I was just looking at these again, not that you guys need to know this part, but what the reason these parabolic reflectors are um, um, uh, an exceptional tool is you can actually control how wide the umbrella is open. So you can open these things and keep them actually very small opening that's a really tight focus light. Then as you start to open up, the umbrella gets bigger. So instead of a typical umbrella that's either all the way open or not, um, these things actually uh, open up in every degree from a very, very tight, almost snoot to being all the way open. And you can sort of see um, there are different sizes in here and there are different openings. So as this actually starts to go through here, but a true breezy umbrella, something like this actually would, would allow you to um, uh, uh, have every stage in between of how open these things ultimately were. Finally, as we continue to work our way over to the left in terms of the model lights, you have a translucent umbrella that's a shoot through umbrella. Then you've got a silver umbrella, then you've got a silver umbrella that's actually a, got a transparent, like a shower cap on the front of it. Um, then you've got another one that's a bit larger. Then you've got a, a, almost a 60 inch umbrella, a 60 inch transparent one, a 60 inch white. Again, you can change some of these, you can change the surfaces. So you can change that white to silver. Um, then we get into strip lights and these have all to do with the sizes of strip lights. 
You can actually add grids to strip lights and you can add internal baffles to strip lights. We'll look at all of that part a little bit later, but you can see it's a pretty exhaustive set of modifiers. And then finally, at the very end here is something that I've ever never actually really seen. It's this thing called a, um, I think it's called a Hillite. They're different sizes. Um, but if you click on one, if you can jump to my screen really quickly, I'll show you what one actually is. I'm going to just drag this guy out here. But what it is, let me hide my camera really quickly. What it is, is it's, looks, it's a box that has got a strobe that shoots in on one side. And then if you look at the other side, it's also got a strobe that shoots in on the other side. If you take a continue to sort of rotate it around, you'll notice that there's little slits that you put those strobe heads in, and then it's finally got a black surround on a back. So it's essentially a light panel that you're able to make using multiple strobes on the sides of it. Um, really kind of interesting. I want to know where I can get my hands on one of those, but at any rate. Um, so that's the uh, mono light part. If we go to the next of the tabs over is speed lights. And in speed lights, these are all portable strobes. These are supposed to be, and it's not, again, it's misleading to call these on-camera flashes, even though you could have one as an on-camera flash. But they're simply small battery-powered uh, strobes here. And they also hey, have sir. of modifiers with them. Did somebody? Hey, Versa. Yeah. Erin's uh, computer froze. Can you let her in from the waiting room again? Yes, I sure can. Jessica's also there. Sorry about that, guys. I, I, I'm i going to do everything I can to kill this waiting room thing, um, because this is just a huge pain in the ass. So, um, but a good move, guys, to just shout out to anybody to say, um, you know, I'm, I'm locked out. Let me in. Uh, OK, uh, so back. Okay, back to, we're almost done, guys. I swear to God, we're almost done, and we're actually going to do something with this thing. Um, so I'm on the speed light tabs along the bottom right here, the next one over. So again, it's speed lights that have a whole lot of modifiers that you can actually add to them. It's not as extensive as the mono lights, but it is soft boxes that you could actually add to one. The next one over is permalites. These are hot lights. So again, you have a ring light as one. These are uh, these airy lights right here. These should be tungsten balance, and I can see if one is. I'm just going to check really quickly by bringing one of them out. And it, again, no, they've got these that are balanced to be um, a daylight light. So again, this is not an HMI light, but it's one that's sort of masquerading as one. So these all look like they're daylight balance as well. But you can see different series of modifiers, different set of hot lights. Again, these would be like the mini mold stuff that we're actually work with at the studio occasionally. Uh, all the way up to the uh, uh, big boys right here. So um, these, again, would be hot lights. The next one over is helpers. So this is where you can actually find backgrounds. They actually do have a cove set up in here. They've got a light blocker. They've got a light reflector. Then they've also got, these are um, uh, completely, uh, these are the things that, uh, again, they have in the studio, the sun bounce uh, set. Um, so there's no sun swatters in here, but there are sun bounces. Again, you can change all the patternings of these. You can do zebras, you can do whites, you can do silvers, you can do mixes of silvers and um, uh, um, uh, uh, gold, uh, that kind of stuff. So again, pretty uh, um, uh, 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 flexible. Um, and then again, a round reflector, and then finally a styrofoam, a styrofoam reflector. Again, all of these things can be modified in terms of their sizes. And then finally, props is the last thing that we'll get to. And then the last thing we get to in props there's a thing called picture wall, which is pretty much, it sounds like exactly what it is. You can see if you look at my screen right here that I can actually put it in a set right here and it will actually, sorry. Uh, a picture wall. Um, you can load your own pictures in this so you can build your own backgrounds in this. There's a, this is actually a really incredibly powerful tool. You can build um, cookies with this and you can actually shoot lights through them. You can do all sorts of, this is how you can build gobos and all that kind of stuff and shoot lights through these things. It's all based on this whole picture wall technology. 
Um, so that uh, is actually pretty good. Um, uh, uh, wall element right now, as far as I know, functions very similar to this. I know there's something else in here, and I don't know what it is yet. So, so that's as far as I got in the software. But don't worry, we're going to get the we're we won't even get up to this part uh, before the end of the night tonight. But that's okay. Um, dummy camera. I don't even want to go into all the bad jokes that should be associated with that. Um, you have furniture. So there's couches, there's couches and, and, and footstools, different styles of couches. Again, all of these are customizable in terms of their color. Uh, and you can also, a lot of these things, you can even change the finish of them, the type. So you can change it from leather to cloth, that kind of stuff. As you continue to work our way over, we go through the whole stool set, whatever, blah, 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 blah. We get to the bedrooms, then we get to living room furniture. It's all essentially designed to be able to create um, uh, sets, as it were. So the bathroom group, uh, plants, as we continue on, um, uh, crates, and then finally apple boxes, which I frankly think should be at the very beginning of this whole list, especially since it's alphabetically begins with an A, that's just me. Um, then you have ladders, columns, and then you've got shapes. And again, all of these shapes are completely customizable to allow you to actually ultimately build sets. Um, then finally, at the very left, I'm sorry, right-hand side of that smaller line window at the very bottom, if you, you'll see that there's two little double-headed arrows that point down. If you click on that, it'll actually collapse that set of tabs. They still sit along the bottom, but it gives you a big screen, a bigger screen area. And then also there's two little arrows that are pointing on the big screen preview part to the left side. And if you click on that, it collapses all of the part that was actually gave you uh, all the parameters to actually adjust the stuff with. If you then click on either one of those sets of errors to go back, you bring back your screens and you bring back all the stuff that's at the bottom. And so that is pretty much a tour around this whole thing. So again, I'm going to escape really quickly here, so wherever you want to stay. Um, last thing I wanted to show you about this, though, <clears throat> are the controls that are actually on that main screen. It's the last interface that we haven't really gotten to. So I'm looking at the main screen, the one that's in the center right now. If you look over to the right-hand side, there's four little icons that are sort of on the right lower hand side. Actually, there's five icons. The one at the very bottom is the one that's supposed to look like it's in yellow right now if you haven't done anything, if you haven't clicked on it. Um, by default, what it does is that it actually, what that thing is telling you is that all of these controls will actually allow you to move around the center of your set. If you undo that thing, it actually, those very same controls allow you to do all the movements around you as the viewer. I have yet to find out a reason to do that. And it's really frustrating because if you uncheck this, the, the, again, the icon at the very bottom, it looks like an arrow going in a counterclockwise motion. Um, <clears throat> it just gets really frustrating. You end up moving around yourself and you're not really moving around the set, which is really frustrating. So by default, that thing is turned on. And in my case, I've always left it on. So there is a couple of controls that we are going to talk about here, the other four that exist right here. If you click on the very top one, and I'm gonna actually click and hold my mouse button down. So it's the circle that's got a little arrow on all of the court, all the cardinal coordinates. So one pointing up, one left and right, and one pointing down. If you click on that guy and then actually use your, uh, sorry, um, click on that guy and then move your mouse, you will actually see it allows you to rotate in three dimensions around your space. So you can even go underneath the floor, you can go outside of the walls, you can come in from the ceiling, you can rotate this around. So that is your three dimensional rotation. If you click on the one that's underneath it, the one that's got just the cardinals uh, arrows pointing and you click on that, what ends up happening is it only moves your screen left to right and up and down. So now you'll notice this is not changing your camera. This is you as a viewer. That's what's happening here. If you click on the magnifying glass, again, click on it and hold it down and then scroll your, cur your, your, your um, uh, mouse towards the top of your screen, you zoom in. If you head towards the bottom of your screen, you zoom out. And then finally, the last of the icons underneath it, the four corners with the plus in it, if you click on that, 
it returns you to the default view that is what this thing looked like when you loaded it. So I can still see all thumbnails of you guys. Did that work for everyone? Okay, if you have, and this would be a strong suggestion for you guys, if you have a right button mouse, so a two button mouse that has actually got a thumb wheel on it, this would be the time to whip it out because all of those controls are actually work off variations of that mouse and it just makes it so much faster so you don't need to worry about coming over here and clicking on these points. So I'm going to show you what they are basically. So for me, I do have a right button mouse that does have a thumb wheel on it. So for me, when I click my right button, it gives me the three-dimensional control and I can simply go around my set like this. If I scroll my thumb wheel forward, it takes me out of the screen. If I scroll backwards, it takes me, it zooms me into the screen. So my, my mouse, uh, uh, my uh, uh, thumb wheel is actually bringing me in and out. If you hold down the space bar and just use your regular left button mouse, you get the up and down, left and right motion. So all of these three things are actually controlled by your mouse. And it just ends up being a lot faster. So for instance, I'm just coming in like this and I can actually see, I can move this. I don't have to select anything else. I'm working just right off of my screen with this mouse. So again, if you've got one, uh, that's great. If you're planning on using this program a lot, I would strongly suggest you get one. They cost nothing. Uh, you don't need to get the fancy great grand one, but anyway, that's what I've got. So that's what I'm gonna work with. So that's pretty much the entire setup right here. 